it's really fun to be here. Um, I will I will just share a screen and get into it. But thank you very much for um, for inviting me. Um, I'm not a birder. I don't I don't I love birds and I've been you know, and, and having uh, <clears throat> having created a habitat garden has has sort of I've tipped my hand. I've sort of become uh, I'm on the I'm on the outside edge of birding, but uh, having now spoke to and consulted with many birders, I realize I have a great deal to learn. But that's the thing I love about habitat design and landscaping and gardening and the whole concept of the move behind the movement is really it's a, it's there's nowhere it's an endless education. So thanks for thanks for having me. All right, go into presenter view. All right. Am I up? Am I good? Yes, yes, you're good. You're good. Great. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I always start with this slide, and I always start with this quote. <clears throat> this is Thomas Rainier. He's a new, um, one of the kind of big figures in the new, uh, the new perennials movement, and I won't go too much into that. Um, he was influenced by Pete Udolph, who did the High Line in New York City and many famous gardens all around the world. Um, I don't always agree with what they say about cultivars and things like that. Uh, but this quote to me uh, is really at the center of how I think about native plants, urban design, and how we educate ourselves to move through uh, all the crises that are facing us uh, coming from global warming. And that doesn't mean that I believe what we do will solve all those problems, but I think it gives us a very powerful approach and, and mindset toward those problems. The next renaissance of human culture will be the reconstruction of our natural world in our cities. Plants will be at the center of it all. Mindful design of nature, the, the mindful reclamation of land back and creating native spaces to me is one of the most powerful tools we have, not just for um, amplifying and rescuing a lot of the biodiversity that we're losing, but also making our urban and suburban systems more robust, not just our ecosystems, but also everything else, water infiltration, carbon sequestration, all those things. Um, I'll touch on a lot of that stuff, but I'll generally focus on as it relates to yeah, habitat and birds. So bringing birds home, yellow, yellow rump warbler. Warblers are already making their way back now. Um, this is at my little, my little fountain in the backyard. And um, there's a great quote, uh, I'm forgetting who it's by. She was a very famous birder who basically saved egrets. I'm sure you know her name um, in the twenties. In Florida, Margaret something. It's it, she. She basically took Audubon to task back in the day, um, and uh, because they weren't able to sort of, they weren't able to attack, um, you know, the the great um, extinction that was happening with so many birds in the twenties due to hat plumage and plumage, and she fought it uh, very beautifully. But her her one of her big thoughts was protect the common. And I, when I think about birds and when I think about like what my habitat is for, my habitat is for the common. My habitat is for the known things, the things that we see every day, uh, you know, the California towhees and the sparrows and the bush tits and all the different warblers and things that come through. If we're protecting the common, then we're doing our job um, because once a thing becomes endangered, you know, we, we've lost that opportunity. This is my inciting incidents, my, my daughter and my son. Um, when my kids were born, I began to think about our yard, right? We live in a pretty urban area. I live about 100 feet from a, a major urban avenue. And, uh, and you'll see my yard later, before and after. But um, when they were born, I realized that they weren't going to have the kind of baseline access to wildlife that I had as a boy growing up in New Jersey. Not that most people think of New Jersey as the most wild place on earth, but it's pretty wild when I was a little kid. So 
I want to talk about native plants and how they act as a cornerstone for all of these things that we're talking about, amplifying and, and sustaining biodiversity and making urban and suburban uh, areas more sustainable, manageable, and more robust and resilient in the face of all these things that we're facing. So why native plants? In one word, co-evolution. Plants and animals evolve together. It takes a long time for certain insects to learn to eat a certain leaf. And uh, over millennia, they figure out those relationships and they can coexist. Plants function as hosts. And in many cases, those plants and those animals are highly specialized. So when you pull those plants out of the ecosystem, you take all those animals out of the ecosystem as well. And we're gonna break down why that matters. Native plants defined, a native plant is one that occurs naturally in a particular region or habitat without human introduction. Only plants found in this country before European settlement are considered to be native to the United States. And the word native should always be used as a qualifier, meaning, uh, for example, a, a geographic qualifier, native to Illinois, native to Southern California, native to the Central Coast, things like that. Um, so, about 90% of all leaf eating insects rely upon native plants for food. Okay, 90% of all insects. This is an average pair of nesting birds consumes between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars per clutch. This is all image and data from Doug Talame. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows Doug, but if you don't, um, he's an entomologist from back east who began to study the actual. Um, the quantities of insects, specifically caterpillars, on native and non-native trees in New England, and, he's, and now those, those studies have rippled outward, and his data has become very conclusive, that non-native exotic trees tend to have considerably less to none of the host relationships with caterpillars and other insects that our native trees have. And uh, we'll get into why that matters. For example, uh, so the relative biodiversity value is told by an oak. So the coast live oak here in Southern California actually supports a staggering 2,300 species that are known to be associated with it. It hosts 500 species, meaning 500 different species depend on that to live, they eat it. They eat the acorn, they eat the leaves, they eat different parts of the tree, and it, it can do that. It has no problem handling that because it's a symbiotic relationship they've worked out over time. Ginkgo, a very common urban tree here in America, um, under pretty close scrutiny by a bunch of different entomologists, uh, Talme was able to find one insect that appeared to be eating it, but he couldn't actually confirm if it had just ended up there. Um, or if it was actually eating it. So, you know, that's just one example. But here in Los Angeles, uh, a study by the New Phytologist Foundation in uh, September, September 17th, they published in 2019, they ran a huge study and they found that 96% of the cultivated landscape of Los Angeles is non-native. So 96% of all of what we see in Los Angeles is exotic landscape. And therefore that 90% of specialized relationships between insects, specifically caterpillars, which we know are now are the fundamental protein for uh, a lot of birds, especially nesting birds, doesn't exist. It's gone. Few fun facts about the American lawn, uh, 40 million acres of lawn in the United States, more daily. Some of them are now turf, which is the most uh, egregious abomination on the land since the lawn itself. Lawns consume up to 10 billion gallons of fresh water daily. They use 80 million pounds of pesticides a year. They use 90 million pounds of chemical fertilizers. They're responsible for 5% of our carbon emissions, thanks to lawn mowers and leaf blowers. The average American child, uh, this was a study at UC Davis, uses their lawn 40 minutes a week. The average adult, about 10 minutes. And of that, I figure they use around 20%. Mm -hmm. So, are we okay? Um, 
So here in Southern California, now that we've realized that we have 96% of the landscape that the, the cultivated landscape is exotic. We also look at, here's a taxonomy chart for shared taxonomy. And if you look at the whole, big bulk of the country, it's generally speaking, a lot of shared taxonomy, a lot of shared plants, animals, things like that. In a couple different regions, it gets a little thinner. They're a little more specialized. But when you get over to California, you see we have an extremely unique taxonomy, an extremely unique um, bi uh, botany and biology. I'm gonna move this right now, sorry. So we are a biodiversity hotspot in Southern California. We're one of 35 in the world. And that means that at, um, up to 75% of our primary vegetation and, and wildlife is threatened. Uh, it also means that what we have here is profoundly unique. So in, in Southern California, here in, our, in the Chaparral, we are uh, first in the United States in mammal diversity. We are fourth in bird diversity, fifth in reptile. It's one of the top ranking number states for animal species at risk. And uh, I believe in the Chaparral, 40% of our plants are endemic, but only 4% of those actually make it into our cultivated ecosystems, which, you know, problematic. So what's the cost of this loss? Well, we know, we know sort of globally, we've lost uh, 3 billion birds since 1970, roughly 20% of all known species worldwide. We also have 40% of all known insect species in serious decline. And these are carpenter ants, uh, these are carpenter bees mating on my Winifred Gilman sage, which means they're trying. It's not their fault, they're doing their best. <clears throat> but we are robbing them of habitat. So the idea of creating habitat where you live is called reconciliation ecology. This is a term that was, uh, came across by Dr. Michael Rosenzweig in two, uh, 2002. And reconciliation ecology is the science of inventing, establishing, and maintaining new habitats to conserve species diversity in places where people live, work, and play. And that for me, to know that I had that kind of agency, to get that where I lived, the dirt beneath my feet had such incredible power was revelatory for me because I had always kind of had it like, oh, I live in cities. I live in a city. And if I want to go to nature, I go out. I go out into nature. I go out into the mountains. I go up into the Sierras or I go up into the San Gabriel as I go visit my family up in Idaho. Um, it had really never occurred to me that wherever I was had the capacity for rejuvenation, revitalization, and amplified biodiversity. So um, we bought a house uh, here in Northeast Los Angeles. And this is what the front yard looked like when I moved in, called it dead sod, dead sod chic. I, and by the way, I'm, if you're a flipper, if anyone's a realtor out there and you flip houses, why put the sod if you're not gonna water it? Just a question, just an aesthetic question, procedural glitch. Um, so this was our front yard when we bought it. This is my front yard now. Um, these are all California native plants kind of starts from a very shady, almost almost like lower Sierra woodland and makes its way out into the very hot, sunny spot. spot. And these are pretty much straight high desert plants from right up in the Antelope Valley and things like that. Um, prior to when it was just sod, uh, we obviously didn't have many animal visitors, but uh, since converting the front, um, I have a kind of steady roster of visitors from towies, wrens, hummingbirds, bush tit, warblers, digger bees, leaf cutter bees, carpenter bees, bumblebees, a lot of alligator lizards, western fence lizards just showed up because I added rocks. Rocks are good habitat. Bush katydid, did shorthorn grasshoppers, morning cloak butterfly, skipper painted lady, hair streaks, monarchs. Um, the list kind of goes on and on. 
uh, we have a great deal of biodiversity visiting this very small spot. It's only about 25 feet by 10 feet. This was the back prison chic. Pretty excited about that when we moved in. Um, and again, we did have some possums. We had some raccoons cruising around. This, by the way, was the Bank of America. That, they lit our yard up like a football field. Don't know why. We had a conversation. They don't do that anymore. Light pollution uh, is a giant issue in all urban areas. The Dark Skies Initiative is a really powerful and intelligent initiative because obviously light pollution, as you know, most of you as birders know, has a, has a profoundly negative impact on bird mig mig migrations and bat populations and you know, all kinds of nocturnal creatures. So I actually got them to turn the lights off and they put a baffle on them and they're they did a really nice job and it's actually very dark in our backyard now. So that, that was my backyard when we moved in six years ago. This is uh, the backyard now. Um, this is gone, this has all been replaced now with native, uh, native grasses and, and kind of like a wildflower meadow. Um, so this is a full sun uh, to part shade chaparral, mostly chaparral mix. Um, Except for the big trees, everything else in my yard now is native, uh, but not hyper local. Some of it's from Central California, some of it's from the Catalina Islands, but for the most part, it's all Central California on down native plants. Um, and a short list of the visitors we have: we have a steady uh, the the raucous visitations of scrub jays, a lot of finches, red-shouldered hawks, uh, Cooper's hawks, towhees, wrens, hummingbirds, bush tits, warblers, and then uh, a big a big host of digger bees and leaf cutter bees, carpenter bees, bumblebees, alligator lizards, western fence lizards, bush katydid, horn grasshopper, also uh, skunks, raccoons, opossums. We have a ground squirrel who's moved in, but who hasn't come out of hibernation yet. And I'm a little worried about that because she should be out. Um, and I mention all these things together because though we're talking about birds, I'm interested in systems. We're trying to create ecosystems. We're trying to create dynamic interdependent systems that function together um, to create more than the sum of their parts. Landscaping, gardening is really looked at as this ornamental thing where you stick these things in the ground and then you don't, you don't want them to move or to change. But what we're really trying to do is, is juxtapose life forms that amplify and make more complex uh, systems. And uh, that's really the fun of it. So habitat defined for birds, food, perch, cover, and water. And we'll just walk through sort of how those things show up in a garden for me. Um, I love this uh, and I'll talk about it more in a moment. I think I put it in the next frame. Oh, I didn't. So food, yes, you can do feeders and I'm gonna get to that. But when you use native plants, you're providing not just uh, nectar for bees and birds and things like that. You're also producing seeds that are a very important food source for uh, many birds and uh, a lot of other things. You're creating mulch and that mulch harbors all kinds of microfauna that is essential proteins for birds and things like that. But here, uh, this is obviously a lesser goldfinch on uh, Cleveland sage. And I got really excited to watch the way that the mama goldfinch would bring her babies in, bring them all onto the sage. The sage is obviously like now, uh, you know, in bloom. So they would pick the little um, aphids and things off of it. Not as much as the bush tits or things like that, the, uh, you know, wrens and stuff like that. But what they really wanted was in a few months when these seeds heads dried, the mama would bring the babies in and show them how to eat the, the seed heads. So when you're working with habitat, when you're using native plants to create habitat, you're taking advantage of all aspects, all the, the beginning, middle and end of the bloom into dormancy of your native plants to create habitat for birds. So fruit, perch, cover and water. Food, uh, this is bush tits, uh, always coming through in that they little, like the little chimes, the little, that wonderful little sound they make coming through in a delightful little flock. And what they're working on is all the aphids and all the small insects that come to the new buds. This is Clarkia. This is a very powerful and important wildflower. 
in part shade in a habitat garden here in Southern California. Uh, it gets, and it's as it first blush, as it first starts to bloom, it gets a lot of little insects on it and it's fine. People always worry about having aphids and things on their plants, but if their plants are healthy, if their plants are robust and they're in the right place, the plant will actually over time produce a, a chemical that will drive those insects away. And also they'll invite in different um, insects and things that'll eat them. So over time, if a plant is in the right place, it's used to having little insects and things on it, what we would call pests. And in the meantime, you have like wrens and bush tits and stuff that will come through and feed off of those. So those little insects are a very important food source. Again, we have the goldfinch here on the Cleveland sage and I use feeders. Uh, and this is also a red-shouldered hawk that <clears throat> uh, learned to feed in our yard. So as you can see, there's no birds on the feeders right now, um, even though he's not a very good aerial hunter. Um, but he would come in and make a pass, often fail. I'll tell you more stories about this because um, what I learned about the feeding, especially for the first year of a hawk's life, and how your garden can play a big role in saving them because it's a very difficult year. And as we know, only 80% 80 80 of all hawks die in the first year of their life because hunting is incredibly difficult. So yes, I use feeders, your plants, your seed heads offer a food source and your native plants will also attract different small proteins. So all different kinds of birds will come through and feed on that. There's that variety of foods available. Quick note on feeders. I use feeders. Why? Because birds attract birds. Wildlife attracts wildlife. Birds attract birds. Um, and it's fun. I love having the lesser goldfinches come to the feeders and every day. And now I'm kind of a routine part of their life. Um, but if you have feeders and you have a very you know, dynamic sort of native plant habitat, even birds that have no interest, the majority of birds that come to my yard, they don't have any interest in the feeders. They don't eat Niger seed. They don't eat even mixed seed or anything like that. Wrens have their own agenda. Toeys have their own agenda. The hawks have their own agenda. Um, the orioles have a different agenda. So the birds that come are all, all they see is that activity around the feeder and they're attracted to that. So they'll come into the yard. And if you have a robust habitat, or even if you have a few different plants and a little bit of mulch, they will use that. So what I, I kind of look at it as like a, it's like a, it's like a dinner bell, but it's not necessarily that dinner. That's just the activity. So birds attract birds and wildlife attracts wildlife. So I'm all for feeders, as long as you use good hygiene, clean up under them, clean that, clean the feeder itself as often as you can, um, uh, you know, for, so that you're not spreading disease or anything like that. And I clean it up off the ground because you don't want to attract too many mice or rats. I live in a very urban area, so not, I wouldn't be a good neighbor if I did that. Perch. Um, your habitat should offer a lot of perch. Uh, birds need to see. Birds are really paranoid creatures, as you know, so they want a really safe place, whether it's the wrens or the jays or the cooper's hawk. They want very safe places to eat from, to watch what's going on. If they're, you know, if, if the cat walks into the yard, they want to be able to, you know, jump from the water straight up into, you know, the nearest shrub, into your manzanita or into whatever you have. So perch is an essential aspect of having habitat for birds cover and I put an alligator lizard and a dove. This photograph, by the way, on the right is not my photograph and I didn't have a chance to pull the credit. I will credit it later. Uh, all the other photography is mine except for two or three images. And I'll make sure that you know what they are. Alligator lizards. So this is my parking strip over here. This is pretty much, denude, you know, it's a parking strip. It's pretty much trampled. But every spring, the clarkia, the poppies, everything grows. And then the lizards come out in force to feed under all that new growth because it's safe, they can't be seen. And uh, there's all kinds of new proteins, insects and things that come to those flowers. So the alligator lizards will just park it under there as will the bush tits and all kinds of ground feeders. Um, and of course, cover is really essential for nesting. So you wanna have, we'll also get into how that functions in terms of height. You want to always think when you're thinking about habitat as having low, 
medium and high, low, medium and high, so that the birds always have some place to go to hide out, to find shelter, to look for food and feel safe. Um, evolution has taught birds to be very paranoid. And if they're in my yard, they have good reason because a lot of hawks hunt in my yard. <clears throat> Water, uh, the thing that I, you know, I, I design and install gardens for people all the time. And, and the thing that people overlook all the time is water. You have to have clean moving water, especially here in Southern California. Um, we've displaced, uh, as we now know, uh, you know, 96% of the bird's habitat. And globally, uh, I'd say nationally, probably the numbers are probably about the same, even across the country. Uh, the numbers that Michael Rosenswag has for actual pristine native habitat in the United States, he puts it at four to six percent. Everything else has been lost to urban and uh, suburban construction, agriculture, and grazing. So having fresh, clean running water for birds is one of the most important things you can do. And uh, I get an enormous amount of activity at my little fountain. So you put it all together and you have low, medium, high, and not everyone has a yard. And obviously you can't, if you don't have a yard, um, there's still a lot of different things that you can do to make a bird feel safe, whether it's on your deck, whether it's on your balcony, by just putting plants and a little bit of water to just give them cover and safety and access to water. Um, and, I do all kinds of different things. I do like stairway habitats and balcony habitats and things like that. The same principles apply. So low, medium, high perch, cover, food in the plants. And there's a couple feeders. I have a platform feeder and I have a Niger feeder back there. And water, always water. So, one of the things that I try to stress to people, no matter what space they have, is if you're gonna put out water or if you're gonna put out food, think about what it's like to be a bird. They're always exposed. And, and, I, and I'm sure all, you know, almost everybody on this thread knows way more about this than I do. Um, but bird behavior is, is just based in paranoia, as I keep saying. And so if I have, what, what, here's my feeder, I have it pretty close to a tree. So if anybody's gonna, and I also have a cover on it so that if the Cooper's hawk comes in and tries to make a pass at the feeder, he doesn't have a direct shot from above and birds can escape into the tree. If someone walks into the yard, they can go up into the tree. Uh, my observation of birds is they'll come to the highest point first, they'll look around, they'll drop down a little lower, maybe even a little lower, and then they'll come into this little, um, manzanita that I have that's right next to the feeder, uh, to the water, and then to the water, and then back to the manzanita, and then back and forth like that. So uh, I just thought that do a nice job of illustrating all these ideas. And to me, all these ideas have to be scalable, right? So if, you know, again, if all you have is a staircase or a, a balcony or something like that, you can still mimic some of this. You can still take some of these ideas and put a tall plant next to your little water fountain or, or next to your feeder, some kind of perch. Um, I always find sticks right here. Here's a stick. I have this thing where uh, anytime there's a fire, I'll go to where the fire is and I'll pull uh, I stick from that fire. I kind of bring it into my yard to, to remind myself where I live and what the reality of our situation is. And I'll sit them up next to water. I'll sit them up near food, things like that. And, and immediately birds will just hang out on them all the time. They love, love perch. They love to be able to see as much as they can see or get under here and hide, 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 hide. Perch, visibility or hiding out. So native habitat gardens, they're dynamic, evolving, shared ecosystems. They're not for any one thing. Um, there's a very famous essay called Cues to Care, and, uh, and I'm forgetting her name. She's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, I think she even, she taught at UCLA uh, for a long time. But 
her basic thesis is that a garden has to be something for everyone if we're going to invest in it, if we're going to care. And so I really believe that native habitat gardens, um, if, you, if you can just kind of give the space over to wildlife, and that's great. But I like to think of it as a way to invite people in and to interact with nature. And I also believe that native habitat gardens and gardens in general like human interaction. I think the plants benefit from it. I think they do better if you interact with them, but you have to interact with them mindfully. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's writings on this, uh, I think make it very clear that human and plant interactions, indigenous people have been interacting with the land for millennia. They've always known to do that. And that's how these systems were maintained and so vibrant and so beautifully for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but it has to be mindful and you have to think about everything else that you've invited into that space and make room for it as well. Ben Vogt, um, who wrote the book, A New Garden Ethic, calls it uh, gardens of defiant compassion which I think is a brilliant quote. So a few little stories about things I discovered when I started doing habitat garden, when, when I converted our yard to habitat. The first thing was uh, one night I came out just after the sun had set and the, all these bees were on the Cleveland sage. And I thought, I was like, oh, I killed them. <laughs> I've, I've killed the bees. Um, why are they doing that? And I called a friend who's an entomologist. And he explained to me that these are male longhorn bees. Uh, they don't, bees, longhorn bees, and most native bees, uh, except for a few, are, are largely solitary. Many live in holes either in wood or in the ground. Uh, they don't colonize like European honeybees. European honeybees, again, is an exotic species um, that's very popular because of its ability to function in, in industrial agriculture. But these bees were out and it started to get cold. And so all they do is they clamp their little mandible onto the stem and they go to sleep. And they said, if you go out in the morning and you wait till the sun hits that thing, they'll warm up and they'll take off. So I went out and they did. But even more interesting, this is a uh, this is a, a um, red-shouldered hawk that learned to hunt in my yard, and I came out one day and it made a failed attempt at a squirrel, and then landed on this low branch. Uh, it's just a it's an old plum tree that uh, died, and I cut it off and I laid it on its side in, in the garden. It's about a foot off the ground in that image. And it just jumped on this branch. And I couldn't understand what it was doing. Didn't, And then it jumped down into the mulch and started scratching like a chicken. So I called my friend Scott Logan at Wild Wings Ecology. And I was like, I have a red-shouldered hawk in my garden right now. Uh, scratching in the mulch like a chicken. And he said, he told me what I'm sure all you know, which is that 80% of all hawks die in the first year of their life because learning to hunt is profoundly difficult. So what this hawk is doing is scratching in the mulch to eat insects, which is then what it did. It was scraping up beetles and things like that. So I wanted to make a slide for this, I forgot, but Mulch, leaf litter, letting your leaf litter fall, not blowing all your leaves away. Letting your leaf litter, litter fall and break down creates humus. And humus is one of the most power, powerful things we have to both amplify biodiversity, infiltrate water, and sequester carbon. Uh, watching, people, uh, watching people blow away leaf litter and make these squeaky clean gardens is one of the most painful things for me to watch because it is so deeply destructive. It kills the soil. It kills all that, that complex microbiology that's happening there that is providing so much food for so many other things. It's that's um, breaking down the soil, breaking down the leaves, breaking down everything and making it healthy and dynamic. But when you leave that humus and when you let that happen, 
it's a food source for all the little wrens and the towies and everybody else who comes through your garden in search of protein. Again, they might see the lesser finches on your Niger feeder, but what they're there for is the proteins in your soil or the proteins on your plants. So I just thought that was like crazy cool. I just had no idea what I was looking at. I mean, the interesting thing is that when I started doing this gardening, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about plants. I didn't know anything about birds. So everything for me has been a process of you know, like ground up discovery. So it's been fun to observe these things and then understand what's happening later. Um, this is uh, one of the Cooper's hawks that came through and learned very quickly to, to get the doves and the finches and things like that. And, um, you know, at, it's just a, it's kind of a, and a thrilling, mildly terrifying thing to watch. Um, Cooper's hawks, like peregrine falcons, they have that longer claw. It's almost like an outfielder's mitt and they're aerial feeders. And uh, when, they, when they land it, it's, it's impressive. These are alligator lizards and alligator lizards, um, very, very common, very common urban lizard, uh, like to be around rocks and around foundations and things like that. They're always foraging through the mulch and they have a bunch of pathways under the brush under that low, remember low, medium, high. They really like the passageways around the low. And, uh, and then, but sometimes I'll find them up in the toyon when the toyon's blossoming or in my pitcher sage up about five, six feet when it's blooming, um, just waiting for those flying insects to come in so they can eat. This is a painted lady butterfly on the sage and uh, two years ago, as you might recall, we had that wonderful super bloom. Uh, unfortunately, in Mexico, northern Mexico, they were having a terrible drought. They didn't have a super bloom. And so there were clouds of painted ladies coming up through and, and nectaring on our native plants. Painted ladies are generalists. They'll, they like a lot of different plants. But if you have, you know, uh, maybe say like a lion's mane from South Africa versus a uh, a Cleveland sage or a white sage, you'll have three times as many butterflies on that. Um, and these are, uh, this is a small leaf cutter bee. It's really diminutive, it's hard to tell. And they're very specialized and they really like to gather on poppies, um, which I've, I'd never seen so many of the same bee at once on a poppy. Um, so I had to go to my, uh, to Crystal Hyman and have her explain to me what I was looking at. Um, I want to talk real quick about the uh, Natural History Museum Los Angeles Biodiversity Bioscan Project. The 80 sites, uh, 1,872 samples, 500 plus species identified, 47 new species. One of the things they found was that water appropriate, in other words, gardens that were correct for Los Angeles, that didn't use too much water and generally focused on drought tolerant native plants, were uh, often 50% to three times more biodiverse than exotic water thirsty yards in and often what uh, were, you know, sort of wealthier constructed gardens. I thought that was pretty cool. But I'm bringing this, I'm talking about the biodiversity scan because they discovered 30 new species of fly in the bioscan study here in Los Angeles. Um, and these are all little flies that breed in mulch. And why you should care about that is because 6% of a hummingbird's diet consists of sugar water, nectar, right? So everybody puts those things out. And a lot of times I see, I see the, the hummingbird feeders in like uh, just lawns, yards with lawns and a row of roses or something like that. And, um, and then those sugar water feeders. But the not, other 94% of a hummingbird's diet is those flies. So when you have mulch, when you have that humus and you let your leaf litter, you're also giving birth to flies. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell people all the time, I'm like, you know, if you wanna know how biodiverse your yard is, get up in the morning when the sun's slanting low and tell me what you see flying around. What do you see? What's flying around your yard? It's a good indicator for how biodiverse the site you're at is. This is a mama barn swallow. Barn swallows are fly feeding machines. Uh, I'll get the name of the study. I just blanked on it, but 
Uh, a study was conducted a couple of years ago. A team uh, of interns watched a mama barn swallow and they counted up to 720 flies being caught by the barn swallows for each chick. This is a, a mama barn swallow that I photographed feeding five chicks uh, in Gloucester, Massachusetts last summer. So 720 times five for how many days? That's how many flies they eat just to feed their young, 720 per chick per day. So we need systems that generate those proteins, that generate that life. And most of the, most of the cultivated gardens we have are very sterile. They might be green, but they're lifeless. This, for example, not a good habitat garden. Okay, just saying, don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, this is just a closing quote from my friend, Barbara Eisenstein, she wrote Wild Suburbia. Um, I just like it because it's a, it reminds us that, I'll just read it. A garden comprised of only or even mostly native plants will provide little food or shelter for birds or insects if it's maintained using today's most common garden practices, removing leaf litter and woody debris, using blowers, applying herbicides and insecticides and heavily pruning trees and shrubs, it destroys habitat regardless of plant selection. These common practices lead to a greater loss of biodiversity than plant provenance alone. I was up in San Francisco on a job a couple of years ago and the, it was a, we were at an um, industrial complex, you know, it's a bunch of offices. And they, were, they had told me ahead of time that I'd be so thrilled because they have native gardens everywhere. And they did, but they had hedged everything into submission and blown the leaf litter away. So yes, they were using native plants, but the native plants were not allowed to create ecosystems. And what we're trying to do is to create ecosystems that amplify all biodiversity. Um, so when you think about habitat garden, uh, get away from ideas like xeriscaping. A big thing that happens here in, in, in Southern California is people have cactuses and a bunch of gravel. That is not what we're talking about. Native ecosystems used in the right place will always be water appropriate because they grew up here and they know what they're doing. It's not a pollinator garden per se. There's a lot of exotic plants you could use that that insects and animals will nectar from, but nectar is not the same thing. I say that like a pollinator garden is like to a village, like what Froyo is. You know, you can go to a Froyo shop and you can have a nice frozen yogurt, but it's not gonna give you the whole life support system of a village. A habitat garden is a village. This is humus. This is the oak leaf litter, which is in Southern California, one of the most important kinds of leaf litter you can have. Um, that's the top breaking down, going down toward all that broken down um, matter beneath and creating humus. Uh, a relationship between actively growing plants, fungi, soil micro microbes, and others in a matrix that includes mineral soil and organic material. And this process, humification, builds topsoil while, restoring while storing carbon in a stable form that can stay put for hundreds of years. Um, when I go into a site that's been left alone for a really long time and I cut into that, it's black. And then you, get, you can get further and further down and then you'll start, start to hit, you know, either it's the DG or the clay of that region. But that top level, that's all just storing carbon while it's creating life for so many things. So it's really important. Um, what does the Wild Yards Project do? We do inspiration, education, and transformation. Um, so consultation, one-on-one -on -one meetings with people to help them learn how they can amplify the biodiversity of their site, no matter how big or small. Um, we do real estate presentations to try and get land uh, realtors to think in a more enlightened way about what they're doing to that land before it gets into the homeowner's hands. And we have a native plant guide on our site that helps realtors buy plants that are more beneficial for the site than the, the plants they normally use. And we have planning resources. We have a map of, of resources across the United States. And that's it, how you can help. Um, just get in touch with us. And 40 million acres of lawn, 10,000 species a year lost. 
whose yard deck windowsill is next. That's it. I will stop my share. Yeah, thank you very much, David. I think Marianne has a couple of questions that were submitted by chat, mm -hmm. and then uh, we can open it up to people who have further questions there. Sure. Okay. So um, Brian Cook talked about Doug Tallamy's advice, uh, recommending a lot of plants that support moths and insects so that birds can eat them. Have you seen recommendations of host plants versus plants that produce seeds and fruit that uh, birds can eat? Is there some sort of ratio that you would think about? Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, I, there are hundreds to thousands of plants in Southern California that provide all kinds of seeds and fruit and things like that. Um, and that function as host plants. Um, many do the same thing. Many do all of that at the same time. Um, it, the, the way that I would sort of frame the question is depending upon where you live, if you live in California, a really nice resource right off the bat is to go to calscape.org, C-A-L-S-C-A-P-E.org, enter your area code, and you can even do a refined search and it will give you a list of plants and you can go into the advanced search mode and you can say, I want a bird garden. And it will offer up a list of plants endemic to your region that fit that bill. Um, that doesn't mean that you can just stick it in the ground and it'll be fine if, you know, depends on like, there's a little more to it. Plants like certain, certain plants, like certain soil and certain orientations to light, but it'll get you going. It'll help you start to to understand um, the plants that actually will offer those different kinds of benefits. But so I couldn't say off the top of my head because it would depend where you are, but there are thousands, thousands of plants that are, that whose leaves get eaten by certain things um, like California fuchsia and sphinx moths, the toyon, the red berries, the toyon that, it, which is to me like the queen of the chaparral. It's a beautiful shrub that gets 15 feet wide and 15 feet tall. And they call it Christmas berry because it makes red berries in winter when a lot of other plants are dormant. Um, that's an essential, I mean, um, cedar waxwings and, you know, and uh, mockingbirds and all kinds of things will like, they'll, you know, they'll focus on that tree um, and make it their own if they can, uh, because the berries are such a, a powerful food source. The Ribes speciosum, which is a fuchsia flowering gooseberry, is uh, has actually changed the migrational pattern of a uh, Anna's or Allen's hummingbirds because it drops a beautiful flower midwinter. So those hummingbirds have learned to they'll stake it out, they'll get territorial with it, and they'll just feed on that nectar. Um, but those are just a, like a tiny handful of the thousands of plants that um, you know that will provide. Be, function both as a host for their leaves for different proteins, but also provide fruit and nectar or seed. All the sages, I mean, I, the list is vast. Um, that's what I do. I, I help people select those plants for their, you know, for whatever they're trying to do. Um, does Wild Yards do any kind of work with, um, you know, equity and the community? I mean, we've read Eric Wood here. Uh, before talking about his research project in Los Angeles and how, you know, trees equal privilege and yeah. uh, native trees yeah. um, is even yeah. better. So I don't yeah. know if Wild Yards is doing anything to reach into uh, our, our uh, neighborhoods that really need more of that sort of thing. Well, I'm, I'm one man and I'm based in Northeast LA. So I have a community garden that I built down on Eagle Rock. Uh, it was an old churchyard and it was just sitting there and they were mowing it and putting a ton of water on it. So I can, it's about 4,000 square feet and I converted it into a native meadow and we do workshops there and, uh, uh, you know, so we have community events there, all kinds of things like that. Um, we work with schools, trying to get educational programs together in schools to help kids kind of have a working living metaphor for uh, dealing with the issues that they're all gonna be facing in the 21st century. And um, 
and things like that. The um, in in terms of you know the 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 thing that I think is kind of like bifurcated and shouldn't be is that uh, in terms of like social justice and food equity and things like food deserts, native plants can play a big, very big role in amplifying the yield for plants, uh, for, for edibles and things like that. UC Davis did a study where they had a 10 acre plot, a 10 acre plot, they took one acre away from the one plot and just surrounded it with native and pollinator plants. And they took the other one, they used traditional methods for farming it. And the nine acre plot that had um, was ringed with pollinators and native plants actually got a higher yield yeah. because native plants um, bring in a greater diversity of native bees. But one of my, one of the things that I think is really important is people don't understand the role of native bees in, in, in making food available to people that too much of the energy goes into, um, you know, European honeybees and Africanized honeybees. So but, Joanne is asking now, will you be working with any governmental agencies in Southern California when more money is available for planting native trees? Do you know about some secret stash of money, Joanne? <laughs> <laughs> what stash would that be? <laughs> I, well, I think something is going on with Newsom and his agencies. You know, I think they're trying to get more money for native plants and native trees. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, uh, I I'm on a I'm on a board right now for a, the a line that's happening from from Pasadena to Glendale. They want to run the bus rapid transit from the from the subway stop in in Pasadena. They want to run a bus rapid transit down through Colorado Boulevard. And of course, there's a whole lot of uh, civic energy around that. And um, but urban trees is not my focus. And, and to be honest with you, government and, and urban civic projects isn't really my focus. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but it, you only have one only has so much energy. And I'm, and I'm very interested in the agency that one can have with the dirt beneath their feet that they can immediately kind of take action on. So, you know, you have to kind of choose your battles. Um, but I'm on that board. I'm working with that. And Jack, to be honest with you, like on a, in, in terms of urban application, native trees, it's a complicated. It's not actually, you know, one can be very emotional about it and passionate about it, but you have to make sure that you're going to bring a native tree into a site that it's going to do well. Um, so that's kind of a bigger conversation I'm happy to have offline with anybody. But my interest on, from the nonprofit side for me is to do more, more outreach and to make habitat and native plants available to more people. So part of that is trying to create this film series that, that positions different um, filmmakers with people of color and people from all parts of the country with the work that they're doing and centering them in those conversations and in their sort of role in the movement. Um, and it, again, and along with that, to get these ideas and technologies in the hands of a greater diversity of people when I go to talks and I'm, you know, my biggest frustration is that it's a mostly white audience and um, this, isn't gonna, this isn't gonna move the needle if we're not really communicating and interacting with all the other different communities around here and find out how they can be, you know, their needs can be met. So David, I'm, I'm gonna take the opportunity with no more questions in the question line to ask one or two of my own. Uh, when you're putting the garden together, um, often the, the, the consideration is what's difficult and what's easy. So if a, I would love to have a hundred year old oak in my yard, mm -hmm. sure. uh, but um, mm -hmm. if you look at me, you probably know I'm not going to get one <laughs> unless I move to where one is. <laughs> so uh, in terms of plants that can become established quickly, that are reasonably tolerant of the average homeowner and their watering or not watering habits and so on, have you kind of narrowed lists down? Um, well, again, it, um, it depends on where you live. It depends on what the site is. Is it shady? Is it sunny? You know, is it is your soil a lot of clay or is it loam? Is it backfill? Yeah. You know, yeah. all of those things matter. But 
it's pretty hard to beat, you know, um, the Toyon, if you want a bigger backdrop sort of shrub. To me, it's one of the most versatile and most powerful, one of the most beautiful shrubs we have, and also one of the most valuable. All the sages, black sage, purple sage, uh, the Cleveland sage, there's, there's a huge variety of sages. Um, our white sage, which is, you know, obviously a very important plant to a lot of the indigenous communities here in Southern California is uh, over harvested and endangered. And so I strongly urge people to grow their own, to not harvest it um, and, and, you know, to use it however they can and also donate it if they can. Um, all the sages are pretty much full sun plants. They grow very quickly. They offer an enormous amount of benefit, both as a host plant and as a seed for their seed heads uh, for late in the season when they head into dormancy and obviously for their flower. Um, I, prob I, I don't know that I've seen more native bees and butterflies on a plant as I have on the, the various sages. The other is the, the buckwheat family. I believe there's over 80 different species of buckwheat endemic in, in, in California, and it's a powerhouse of a, of a biodiversity plant and a host. Um, I like a lot of my church garden is, is mostly straight species that were all propagated from either Griffith Park or along the LA River, and that's all buckwheats, uh, California sunflower, um, coyote brush, um, I have over 35 different species of plant in that 4,000 square foot area, and they're all doing very well. So, um, you know, of those things that I just named, like there's, you know, there's so many uh, different varieties available, different species available just under those. But yeah, I mean, I, if anybody wants to email me at wildyardsproject.gmail.com, and I will uh, happy to sort of fire off you know a list but the sages grow quick in two years you'll have a three foot high you know cleveland sage or black sage or any of those things if you're in full sun buckwheats are a little slower but once they get going they're really happy there's there's low ones and there's ones that grow really tall um it's a giant and kind of resplendent family of plants uh there's really many and all the ribes all the current the current family that's that's blooming all over if you go around right now, they're, they kind of they, they do a lot of winter blooming. So the golden current on your hillsides is is going off right now. And uh, and then a lot of other ones will be coming online really soon. So there's a nice comment from Aaron Chianese uh, that uh, you're a great resource is at the California Native Plant Society and the Thomas Paine Foundation. Theodore uh, Payne. They are uh, certainly uh, good for struggling with problems. We, I don't know if you want to call that a problem or not. Our yard is pretty shady, so we we have only limited the spots for those sun-loving California plants. So we, it's both a blessing and a problem. But yeah, well, your house is cool. Yeah, uh, there's right. there's actually a lot of shade plants. Again, I would go to I'm gonna just do. I'm such a slow typer. Yeah, we actually had a consultant come in, Tim Switzer, who was an intern at Theodore Payne. And, uh -huh. and um, I know Tim. Rec recommend a lot of stuff. And yeah. even Tim was kind of stupefied by our shade problem here. Yeah, well, I have a, that whole front garden of mine is, is goes from full shade to shade. And so I use a lot of, I use a lot of Eucara. I use a lot of uh, Ribes viburnifolium. I use coffee berry. I have uh, Mahonia berbicyclifolium. And uh, they're all doing well. They're all doing really well. Let's try them out. Okay, so anybody else have questions that they would like to raise? Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now and uh, we should be able to post this. Um, oh, 